four in the back there, and anybody that wants one can take it. They're in a box, and Suzette will put them out. Thank you. That's good stuff. Please take one. If there's some left over, maybe for somebody that uh, you know that would appreciate it too. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we praise you and thank you on this day, the feast of St. Louis, King of France, who was single-hearted and loved you with all his might, never let the responsibilities and pressures of King get in the way of his personal relationship with you. And because of that, he was a great King. We pray, Lord, that your blessing will fall upon us, that we will never allow any pressures or burdens to overwhelm us, but that we will always, like Louis, take uh, everything to you and trust that you will make all right. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay. Can we go to the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Beautiful picture. Does anybody know what this picture is of? Can you kind of figure it out? Not transfiguration, but you are close. So somebody there is on fire, not hurting him. That went up. Okay, what's his name? Elijah. 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 Oh my goodness. You're kind of around in the prophet Elijah. Okay. That's Elijah. And you remember he has taken up body and soul into the kingdom of heaven in the Old Testament. And the one who is there trying to, you know, beholding what's going on in wonder and awe is Elisha. Okay. And Elisha becomes the prophet after Elijah and becomes a great prophet in his own right. So tonight we're talking about prophets. And maybe uh, something that we can get out of the way really quickly. We go to slide three, please. Well, what just is a prophet anyway? And a lot of people, when they hear the word prophet or being prophetic, many times they think that we're talking about someone that's telling future events, something that, like Nostradamus or something, something that's going to happen in the future. And there can be some of that involved, but actually the biblical and, and the way the church today looks at prophets is someone who makes known the will of God often calling the people back to obedience to the covenant and denounces injustice, idolatry, apostasy. So I, I want you to remember that um, God made a covenant with Abraham. He makes covenant with Moses. We all know that one through the Ten Commandments. And there is a covenant, but we call him Jesus Christ. He is the fulfillment of all covenants. So it's as if if you were to take um, some great books and stack them and then stand on top of them and say, they're all in here. I got it all in here. Just ask me. And that's something that we can say is what the Lord does. Um, so we have all the, the books, all the truths, all the teachings of the Old Testament. And it's as if Christ is standing on that and says, I am the fulfillment of all that. This is what all of those prophets have been pointing to me. Okay. So you also have a covenant with a small C with God. So we're talking about covenant with a big C. You know what happens in the history of salvation. But you also have a covenant with God, and that, again, is through the sacrament of baptism. Okay, an agreement has been made between you and the Lord. You belong to him now, which is makes you 
a very significant treasure. So I'd like you to like to suggest to you that there are lots of people in the world and the devil wants us all. He wants every single one of us down to the last to be in his kingdom. But he especially wants the ones who have made a covenant with God because he wants to inflict pain on God. And he does this by trying to woo away from the covenant that has made you and me into his kingdom. And remember that baptism places an indelible mark, a mark that cannot be erased on our souls. That's why you can't be baptized more than once. Baptism is once and it's forever. You're claimed by God. And so in heaven or in hell, you are identified. And that will be part of hell is knowing that you were, you belonged to him. There was a time when you were not lost. Okay? There was a time when you belonged completely to him. And that is part of the, the punishment of hell. So now I want to take it one step further. And this is why the devil is so intrigued, obsessed with abortion. Because it is the most innocent of all humans. The most vulnerable, the most pure of all humans. And to be able to take them before baptism can be given, you know, is a crown for him. See? And even though the child does not belong to him, but the willful destruction of someone that would and could have made a difference, maybe become a great saint, maybe become a great uh, woman or man of our century, you know, all of that is erased and lost now. See? And so um, in his bitterness and anger, he tries to destroy what he can before the end, before his end. He knows his end is coming. Now he's just obsessed with doing as much damage as he can. We'll look at that in the second half of tonight. But I want you to understand that abortion and all the things that happen to, to little ones, this is really a, a very diabolical, serious part of his plan to confront God. And it has always been that way. From the very beginning in the um, Old Testament, uh, the mystery religions, all these religions, they, they took advantage of the little ones. And uh, there is, I was just reading, there is a new cult that follows Baal, B-A-A-L. That is one of the horrendous gods of the Old Testament that the Jews abhorred. There is a new cult that has risen up in Europe, and um, they believe in that God. And so they're very violent, and um, God only knows what they're doing. But to think that someone has given over to some a violent uh, false God, you know, it, it's hard to fathom, I know, for, for you and for me to think that People would give themselves over to such horrendous um, ugliness, but it happens. Um, in Mexico, um, there is that cult of, uh, it looks like the Grim Reaper, and they're treating it as a god, and it has become a demonic force in Mexico. Okay, and so um, I, I was just, uh, there was a little program on Netflix, and it was on bakery and baking and all over the world. And so I, you know, clicked on it to see. And what comes up is this bakery in Mexico. Great. And then in the corner, instead of having our Lord or our Lady Guadalupe, there's the, the Grim Reaper. And I thought, oh, my gosh, of all bakeries to, to find and to put that out as kind of an ordinary bakery in Mexico, which it isn't, thank God. But um, this is a, a false god that especially the cartels and the drug cartels, they all have that god. That's their god for protection. Okay? So there's a lot of ugliness that runs under all of this stuff, right? And um, so when you wonder about, well, how, how is it that people send themselves to hell? This is how they do it. 
They break their covenant because all those people, or most of them, were baptized into faith. They break their covenant and they make a new covenant. And that false God will hold them to it. See? And Christ cannot free them if they are not willing to be freed. See, not that he doesn't want to, of course, he got tied on the cross to, to do this, but you and I have to say yes to life or to death, to Christ or to, to darkness. And that yes, whichever way it goes, will take us all the way, right? To either an eternal horrendous existence or an eternal joy, you know, that is beyond, as St. Paul, beyond even our, our understanding. Okay, so far so good? Um, idolatry, I just want to point out, for the Jews is the worst sin possible. Throughout the Old Testament, that's the one sin that first comes up all the time and has to be dealt with. And oftentimes the prophets are haranguing about that. And oftentimes God himself will be moved to um, punish because of idolatry, because the people will throw themselves into the arms of a false living, false God. There was a question. Yes, Dr. Uh, so uh, like in the book of Jeremiah, one of the main prophets, uh, there's a lot of discussion about false prophets. How do we know the difference between you know, a, a prophet and a false prophet? Well, we'll get to that because actually um, the decay actually, what's it called? <laughs> How, what is it? <laughs> right, good. You're going to call your next uh, little dog, Didache. <laughs> okay, so um, you'll, you'll see that the Didache is actually very, very interested in figuring out what's the difference between a false and a true prophet. We'll get to that. So the prophets are often mocked. They're imprisoned, uh, like Jeremiah, like we've seen in the readings lately. Many of the prophets end up getting martyred. The last prophet... It, the, the Bible considers the last prophet to be who? Christians consider him to be the last prophet. Is he? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Oh, very good. John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is a very interesting figure because he's the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He brings the promise of the Old Testament in himself, and he welcomes the truth and promise of the New Testament. And John the Baptist, of course, is the cousin of Jesus Christ. And St. Jude is the cousin of Jesus Christ. St. Jude often is shown holding a image of a, a face along his chest. And that image is Jesus. And it was in the ancient, ancient text, it's often said that he looked like Jesus. And so the um, the early church revered him very much, loved him very much, not only for today and because he was an apostle, but also because of the resemblance that was there. It's a beautiful physical reminder of Christ. Okay. So if you will look at your Didache, Just going to try and get to the main chapter that we want to start at. Chapter 11. And we'll walk through a little bit of this, and hopefully, some of these questions will naturally be answered. So, in chapter 11, if you look at verse 2, if the teacher himself, now, now one of the things that comes out in, in this chapter is we're talking about apostles prophets, and teachers, okay? So, so read between the lines. So what's happening is there is already organization being acknowledged in the church. It's not just a group of people getting together and praying in the Lord, but now we have moved into a new phase where the church, because she's growing and rapidly, 
She needs to organize herself. She knows that she is a church because that was given to her through Christ. Thou art Peter. So on this rock, I will build my church. The Lord uses this word. Okay. So we know that the Lord has an intention that we're not just a, a very loose group of people um, that believe sort of the same thing, but actually we are a people that are united in a truth, okay? in a teaching. And because of that, well, there needs to be organization. And if you look to the Acts of the Apostles, you know, too, you remember that um, the deacon, the acronym, or the deacons are created to help the apostles because there's too much work. And what's happening is that some elements of the community are being neglected or feeling neglected, especially the widows and those that are in need of uh, you know, charity, the poor and so forth. The apostles are doing preaching and witnessing. And so the deacon is created in order to assist uh, the apostle in the area of charity. Their first vocation and call is to charity. Okay. First call of the priest actually is to preaching. Not, not celebrating the Eucharist or the sacraments, but his first call is to preaching because from preaching comes everything else. See, from preaching comes truth, from preaching comes the sacraments. But the, the deacon is to assist the um, community in the place of charity. Today, the deacon also can assist in the liturgy. In the Roman Catholic Church or the Latin Church, the deacon does in any of the other ancient churches. In the other ancient churches, for instance, you, we read how the deacon in the beginning, did you see that he gives Holy Communion on, remember? We, know, we saw that. But today in the ancient churches, he does not give out Holy Communion only in the Catholic Church. But in the Orthodox, only the priest or bishop may give out Holy Communion. And the deacon becomes almost like the voice of the people in the liturgy. So in the East and West, they're developed um, in worship where you had a choir or the deacon, even in our church, who would answer the responses. The priest would say, a prayer, then he responds for the people and so forth. So um, the people entered into a very reflective and meditative um, uh, moment and then uh, reception of Holy Communion and so forth. But really it was um, the, the kind of participation or, uh, that happens today where there's so much singing and so forth um, that's really a, a kind of a, a late development, because even before the Second Vatican Council, we had beautiful music, right? You have Mozart, you have Bach, you know, the mass uh, selections that they wrote and so forth. But that was all done by a choir. So it's always a choir that's responding to, to the priest. But one of the um, very direct invitations of the Second Vatican Council was that we should be more attentive to what's happening. Now, I have to tell you that in the Second Vatican Council, the intention was not to go to the vernacular for the entire Mass. In other words, not to go to English Mass, Spanish Mass, Polish Mass, whatever. Um, but there were elements that were going to be now in vernacular or in the language of the people. Elements that were going to be in English, but not the full Mass. And probably the Church Fathers would be very surprised at what happened, you know, um, would happen later. Um, but in the beginning, it was assumed that certain parts like the Eucharistic prayer um, would remain in Latin. And then the other parts, including the readings, of course, and the homily would be in the, the language of the people. Um, but over time now to really, it's intentional if we have, um, Latin music, music in Latin, or if we have uh, the Agnus Dei, um, which a lot of us still remember, which is good, go to any parish and, 
and say on Newsday, and everybody responds just like that. Everybody remembers that. The Kyrie, everybody remembers that. The Kyrie is the only thing left in the Catholic Mass from the time when everything was in Greek. There's a time when the Mass was completely in Greek. That's the only thing left now, the Kyrie. Um, in the, the rest of the pieces that we have are parts of the Mass with Latin. It's very, it, I hope, uh, I used to encourage, at least in the, the trilingual and um, parishes, that we remember the Paternoster. Because it always bothers me that we, we say, okay, let us now, you know, we, we pray um, the words that Jesus gave us, or I can't remember the, the new, by divine, you know, we have new formulas with the, with the missile. But it, when you're when you're brought up under the old formulas, it's hard to, you know, to to not go back to them sometimes. But anyway, with the Our Father is this unifying prayer, right, in the Mass. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, we're not quite sure how to how to say it because we say it all in English. But what about the people in Spanish? What about the people in Vietnamese? And or we do it all in Vietnamese. Definitely, everybody else is not going to understand. You know. What we're saying so you just have to kind of say it under your breath and it's not a very lovely uh solution i think for me the solution is to say the our father in latin because all of the communities still remember at least and can remember can learn it again and it's a beautiful prayer uh, i think everybody should know the hail mary the, the glory and the our father in latin everybody should know that Gloria Patri Fidi, Spiritus Sancti, Super Principio, et nunc et semper, te secula seculorum. Amen. It's beautiful. Or the Ave Maria, right? That, that, it's all that Latin, right? Grazia plena, Dominus tecum. And the Pater Noster, very, very beautiful. That's part of our heritage. So one of the things, too, is we don't want to let go of everything because it would be very sad if we're the Latin Rite Church. We just remember the Agnus Dei now. You know, but we should remember our, our history. Okay. So, um, what happens very interesting too is that the apostles eventually, that title will eventually only be ascribed to the 12. And we have in the beginning a problem. And St. Paul will talk about this in some of his letters about what he calls the super apostles. And the super apostles are a group of preachers who call upon themselves, they say they are one with the apostles, they are one in that dignity, but they begin teaching, but we are better, stronger, we have a better message. Okay. And we fast more, we do more penance. And Paul will take offense. And eventually he will begin preaching against the super apostles who think that they are better than everybody else. And so what happens is the church begins to delineate and to say, you know what? There's only 12. That's it. We don't give that apostle that title to anybody else. And the, the super apostles will eventually, um, what is thought is, begin to lead into error. And this is a big concern of Didache. So if we're reading between the lines again, look at all the chapters we have now on prophets. You know, compared to other things in the Didache, there's a lot of attention given to prophets. Why? Because there's a problem. And so the church feels like she has to clearly delineate what is and what isn't a prophet. What is and what isn't a teacher. A teacher has to teach the truth or they are expelled because they are seen as what in sheep's clothing? Wolves, wolves in sheep's clothing. So this is something that um, I think all of Christianity has really been um, infected with. There was a time when teaching was very clear but over time, something has happened where there's been this really messiness um, about what people believe, not just Catholics, but other faith traditions too. What does a Methodist believe? What does a, a Presbyterian believe? What's the difference 
with what a Baptist believes or an evangelical believes. Um, and how many times, you know, on simple things like um, people will say, well, Father, I, I went to the Protestant church on the corner and it was great, you know, and they obviously they loved Jesus and and we were singing and we were praising and um, and so, but I didn't go to Mass on Sunday, but I went for, you know, an hour and a half to this service, and it was beautiful. I mean, I really felt the presence of the Lord. Okay, that's wonderful. You know, there's nothing wrong in going to a praise night or something like that. But but to to somehow think that that's the same as the Eucharist is, is wrong. Uh, we're taking something and building it higher than what was given by Christ at the Last Supper, which is his, his last will and testament, as it were, and where the bread and wine actually become the body and blood. Now, we have praise nights, right? We have nights uh, in Spanish, Noches Alabanza, where you have guitars and we're singing and praising the Lord. Um, we do that in charismatic circles. Um, we have... Um, Nights where um, it's not charismatic, but there's beautiful music and, and reflection from scripture and so forth. I mean, we have that. But the Catholic Church would never say that's on the same level as the Mass. The Mass is the supreme prayer of the Church. There's nothing higher for the Church than the Mass. Okay? And that would be the truth in all the ancient churches. They would all hold this. Whether you call it the Mass or the Mysteries or the Divine Liturgy, Whatever of the ancient churches, remember, those are all the churches I'm referring to before Reformation. They all, we all hold the same teaching about the essentials. Except for the Holy Father. That's, maybe we'll have, someday we'll have a, a class on all that too. Um, what's the differences? But in the essentials of sacraments, um, we all believe in the seven sacraments. One of the things that um, the Orthodox, who I've mentioned, it's a big thing for me in my work with the Orthodox. Um, they believe in confession, the sacrament of penance. And even Martin Luther did. Did you know that? Even after Martin Luther broke away, he said, if people come to you and request confession, give it to them. If they come to you, if they really need it, give it to them. So he did acknowledge that um, confession uh, had its place. Later on, centuries later, the Lutheran Church let go of that, but Martin Luther didn't. By the way, Martin Luther also had a great devotion to Mary, which a lot of people don't know. He wrote poetry to her, and he believed that she was free of all sin, that she was a uh, ever virgin. So, but that got lost in history, you know, later. Um, so with the Orthodox, um, they do believe in confession, but it's a sort of a general confession that's done. Um, it would be like, um, for us, the re really the only way that a general confession happens in our church is in a moment of emergency, critical moment. The easiest one would be if we're on a plane and it starts to go down, I should jump up and say, is there anybody Catholic here? And of course, there's going to be a few and some wishing they were. <laughs> and then I would say, I absolve you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit of your sins, you know, because we're going down. And if we survive, then you get to confession. But that would be confession. Okay? Last confession. But what I tell my Orthodox friends, priest friends, is even psychologically, there's something really impressive about um, the sacrament of confession. Um, and this is why Christ gave it to us, to free us. So that I sit down with you and we talk. And you have faith that this conversation is shadowed by the Holy Spirit. And by my ordination, because that's what Christ gave me, that gift of ordination, not only do I change bread and wine into the body and the blood, but I have the honor and privilege of helping you to reconcile with Christ. Not only to grow in him, but to reconcile in him too. 
and um, to remit or remove your sins. That's a big deal. For some people, they just kind of go through life, and then at the end, right before death, they get panicky, and they want to see a priest now because it becomes very clear that I need to do something about this before I meet the maker. Well, sometimes you're not going to be able to find a priest. When my grand, uh, grandfather, no, my grandmother was dying at Garden Grove Hospital, I called my parish, I was a seminarian, um, ended up calling three churches, you know, it was after hours, but you have an emergency line, every Catholic church has an emergency line, and nobody got back. And then I called the Columban Fathers, because I knew them, and Father came just like that, and came to the hospital, anointed, and then, you know, said a few words to us, and I walked him out. I said, Father, thank you so much. I said, you know, I called the other parish. He says, oh, oh he was a saint. Oh, don't, don't worry. He says, you know, the other fathers, I'm sure something, something came up, something. But God found a priest. That's the important thing. Don't worry. And I remember thinking, you were, I talked to him, so I'm walking, I thought, gosh, maybe I should be a Columbian. And, and that calmed me down again, put me right in the right place. Said, of course he's right. I mean, how do I know? You know, now I'm a priest, right? And we're priests. And sometimes things happen. We can't be in three places at the same time, even though three calls come in or, you know, those things happen. And so um, we do the best we can with it. But, and this is why I tell people, you want us to get married? Okay, but think out the consequences. Because if we're married and have families, we're not going to be 24 hours like we are the whole, you know, these centuries and centuries of the church. We're not going to be able to make it maybe to the hospital in the middle of the night and all those kind of things when little Johnny is, has a fever and his mom has COVID. And, you know, so, I mean, the church is very wise in, in a lot of ways, you know, with priesthood. Um, you know that in the Eastern Church, Orthodox, Eastern Catholic, um, their priests may marry, but only before they're ordained. And in the Orthodox churches, the bishop cannot be a married priest. He can only be a celibate priest. And those are usually the priests from the monasteries. You know, you see the Orthodox bishops and they wear a big veil and black and because that's what they wear in the monasteries. So they're just wearing what they always wear. You know? So that's part of their little religious habit. And they're from the monasteries. You know? So I, I was talking to one bishop recently and, and um, from the Orthodox and, and I asked him, I said, so um, Father or Eminence, have you seen um, this movie, whatever movie it was? And uh, he, he looked at me and says, Father, I have never been to a movie. I said, what? He says, I've never been to a movie. He says, I do the liturgy. I visit the people and the priests, and I come back to my house. I, I don't go out to, you know, entertainment or football games. Or he says, no, no. And then I, it, it, you know, I remembered, well, of course, because you're a monastic. If that's what you're used to. You never, you're in a monastery, you don't go to all these things, right? And so, um, and this is part of sometimes the tension is you have a monastic leading a diocese and wanting the priests who are married and in the parishes to live a monastic life when that's not what they've grown up with. So there's a little bit of a uh, attention there sometimes in orthodoxy. And it's one thing that at least in the Catholic traditions we avoid because we only have one kind of priesthood. You know, we have religious and we have monastics and all that, but any of them can be become pope or bishops. Right. Okay. But we do, or they do agree with us that um, a bishop must also always be celibate. And that's been the you know, the, the teaching and the uh, the life of the church from the very beginning. Okay. Yes, question. Okay. 
So going back to confession, the question is, doesn't that first part of the mass take care of um, those things? Isn't it a kind of confession? Yes and no. So the beginning part of the mass, especially the, you know, the Kyrie or the I confess to Almighty God three times, you know, to my fault, to my fault, to my most grievous fault. This is a preparation for the Holy Sacrament, but it purifies you um, so that you may now receive in, in complete purity of heart. It takes care of all venial sins, but not mortal. Sins have to be confessed in, in the sacrament of confession. Okay. Um, just a little step further from that. Hmm. When you have the kiss of peace, I remember years back, you know, um, offered to each other the kiss of peace. And then all of a sudden people are running around church, running around, all over, hugging, and, and then waving over to the corner, the other one waving, and say, hey, it's not here. Uh, it's a long time. You know, and there's all this going on. That's not what that moment is for. Okay? And it's really kind of beautiful. What it is is that we are we are at the very moment of receiving the body of Christ, okay, the Lord Himself. Now we've been prepared. We started off acknowledging that we're sinners. Then we um, heard the word of God. After the word of God, our gifts were brought up along with our hearts to the Lord. Then the bread and wine was consecrated, and we adored Him, and we said, "Yes, You are the Lord," and we believe. And then the Our Father crowned it because that's the, the prayer that Christ taught us, the only prayer he taught us. And then we go into the kiss of peace. And this is right before reception of Holy Communion. And there's a reason for it. First, because scripture talks about, you know, do not come up to communion unless, you know, you drink judgment upon you, unless you have reconciled if you need to reconcile with your, your neighbor, right? But beyond that, what's happening is when I say, peace be with you, and you say, peace be with you, and with, well, not at that time. Remember at Kiss of Peace? You don't say it with your spirit. He's, you know, he's peace yeah. with you, peace yeah. be with you. Okay. And so what's happening is you are giving what you have. You have come to this moment of the mountain peak, and you are saying, I have the Holy Spirit and I give him to you. And then the person responds by saying, and I give you the Holy Spirit. And so it's an exchange of grace, it's exchange of the Holy Spirit before the reception of Holy Communion. It acknowledges that there is no division. It acknowledges that there is preparedness and readiness to receive the most pure Christ. Okay. So because of that, it should be measured. Peace be with you. God bless you. You know, but it but it stays on that plane. You see, it's not a break in the mass. It's like oh, okay, you know, you know, it's like taking a cigarette break or something and then getting back to it. Okay, so it's it's part of the liturgy. It's part of the whole thing. It's not a break. It's continuing. It's moving. But but don't unspiritualize it. I guess so, you know, hug your family, hug your kids or whatever. Show your grandkids. That's all part of it. But, but it has to remain on a level that, um, that we are sharing with each other. The Holy Spirit has prepared us now to receive worthily um, the Christ. Okay? So, um, on verse 10, every prophet teaching the truth, if he does not what he teaches, he is a false prophet. There you go, Tom. So, Definitely, the prophet is measured by the gospel. So the four gospels and the words of the Christ. And if he says something that moves away from that, then he will be known, he will be seen as a false prophet. But then it goes even further. 12, verse 12. Whosoever shall say in the spirit, give me silver or anything else, you shall not listen to him. But if he tell you to give on behalf of others that are in want, let no man judge him. So, once again, the Didache, read between the lines, what's going on? Well, it appears that some people have been saying, you know what, you should pay me before I give you a blessing. 
before I share the word with you, pay me. Okay. And so what will develop later in the church, you know, the donation you give at mass, maybe a donation for the mass, and that could be nothing, by the way. <laughs> Hopefully it's something, but it doesn't have to be. Um, Pope Francis has reminded us that, that the donation at mass is a free will donation, but you don't buy mass. It's not your mass. Okay, Father, I gave you 15 bucks, so now it's my mass. No, it's not your mass. You can't. You can't own mass, right? Now you can have an intention for mass. It's one of the intentions like the gifts that are brought forward to Christ, but um, Christ owns himself. Okay? It's his celebration, right? So, um, uh, but in the old days, especially when we lived in sides and there was, you didn't have big cities and so forth, that donation of a few dollars would help the priest to live. Now you could get something to eat, or you could buy chickens, or you could buy, you know. And a lot of times uh, when people were in the old days, when people were bringing up the gifts, they brought up a chicken, they brought up fish, they brought up, you know, just depended on what they were offering. As you can imagine, you know, um, this beautiful little church we have in St. Anne's, and then seeing a, a cow being brought down the middle of the church. Here we are, Father, that's for the whole year. <laughs> So, um, but that was the reality because we were agricultural, right? But now we have live in a different time. And so there you are. And I, I know a priest that uh, he retired and he went to live um, uh, somewhere outside of Las Vegas. And he would say mass uh, uh, at a church there in Las Vegas. And the pastor there said, well, Father, the, we've worked out with a couple of casinos where we can say mass in, in the casinos as well. And would you, you know, oh, sure, okay. And so he would go and celebrate Mass in a, a room that was set apart for Mass, okay. And then the people would throw their chips in. <laughs> well, and, and there's, you know, oh, the church has to grapple with these questions like, well, okay, should you have Mass in a casino? Yeah. And it's a good question because you want to maintain the sacredness of something too. Um, but I will tell you, like, uh, there is, uh, I think it's Christ our Savior or something. There's a, a huge, huge Catholic church on the Strip, and their priests um, have 24 hours confession. And they get a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because lots happens in Sin City. <laughs> okay. So, um, Bourbon Street, Bourbon Street in uh, New Orleans. Oh, maybe in Bourbon Street too. Yeah. Okay, so um, if we move on, so if you were to read, continue reading, you're seeing again um, what is worthy, what isn't worthy, and um, uh, what should a prophet ask, what may he not ask, or a teacher. Now, let's move to chapter 14. Verse one, on its own day, gather yourselves together and break bread and give thanks. First, confessing your transgressions that your sacrifice may be pure. And again, um, now we, we dealt with this in the early document, but here we are again about the importance of confession, confessing your sins before receiving Holy Communion. Now, in some places, sometimes I will get people um, in confession who will tell me that um, they were taught that, especially if they're from Mexico or Latin America, that uh, before they can receive communion, they have to go to confession. That before every time they go to Holy Communion. That's not the, the teaching of the church. Teaching of the church is you go to Holy Communion when you're free of mortal sin, but um, you go at least, according to canon law, the law of the church, you must go at least once a year, or you should not receive communion then. At least once a year. That's Mother Church being really generous and loving you beyond love to say, just visit me once, okay? You know, like your, your grandma who says, just come once. I'll make you a nice dinner and, you know, we'll have a nice... 
and just trying to to get the grandkids to come at least once a year to see her, right? That's almost the the kind of way the church, you know, she says, just once come to him. But in reality, we should be receiving confession frequently because it's not only taking away sins, it's as we talked about, it's also putting God's grace and love in us, in us, his mercy. It's catechetical so that we are learning how to not fall into sin and is shaping us and forming us into a good people. It gives you the gift of humility. It breaks down pride. And it is the one place, and I will often ask um, teenagers or young adults, like with their on retreat, I'll ask them, because we have a longer time because it's retreat to give them confession, so we take a little bit more time. And I'll say, you know, these things you're talking to me about, um, is there any, anybody else you really talk to about all this? And, and they just say, no. And, and I say, how lucky you are, right? That Christ is giving you commitment. You can tell me anything. I can't tell the Pope. I can't tell your mom. I can't tell anybody what you say to me. It's just between the three of us, Jesus, you and me. And I remain, I have to remain silent under pain of excommunication. If I break the seal of the confessional, I am automatically excommunicated from the priesthood and from, and from the church. It's that serious. Okay. And the reason why the church is so strict, even on the priest, about that is because you can't fool around with it. If people are going to have confidence and bring their sins to confession, then they need to be assured that we don't go blabbing. And we don't. Any priest would be horrified if he heard that another priest was breaking the seal. Honestly, he'd be horrified. It's just one of those things we do not touch. You know, we get it. And we would never do that because then we have to answer to him about that. And that would be really, really bad. So, um, okay, so far so good? Yeah. All right. So that your sacrifice may be pure. So you confess your sins so that your sacrifice, what you bring to the Lord, your heart, your life, it will be a pure offering and not like Cain's offering, but like Abel's. Okay? Don't bring something damaged. Not knowingly. Right? Not knowingly. Okay. Chapter 15. All right, now we're here at bishops and deacons. Appoint for yourselves, therefore, bishops and deacons worthy of the Lord, men who are meek, not lovers of money. There we are again, the money thing. True and approved, for unto you they also perform the service of the prophets and the teachers. Okay, so bishops and deacons actually come out in the, uh, their roles are, are uh, come out in the uh, Acts of the Apostles. Um, Sometimes the word presbyter is used or elder or bishop. It's the same. Okay. Remember, bishops came first, then priests, then deacons. We have a little church that's growing, 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 growing. Organization happens. Then along the way, we get cardinals, monsignors, and so forth. But remember that, for instance, cardinal, monsignor, um, these are not titles from scripture. They could be done away with any time by the Holy Father. It was created by the church. It can be uncreated by the church. But bishop and deacon and priest cannot be uncreated by the church because she has to remain faithful to the gospel. See? So the church never has the authority to create or do anything that is opposed to the word of God. She has to uphold and support what is ever in the New Testament or what the Word of God. And she ceases, in, in a sense, existentially, she would cease to be the church if she did that. Therefore, despise them not, for they are very honorable men. Remember that when you think of me and Father John. <laughs> 
<laughs> Reprove one another, not in anger, but in peace, as you find in the gospel. Let no one speak to any that has gone wrong towards his neighbor, neither let him hear a word from you until you repent. Um, so there is, a, again, a reminder that when people really go off the cliff, uh, we want them back, we pray for them, but don't um, socialize as if nothing's wrong. And that's a hard thing. It's a very hard thing to do today, even because there are so many family members and friends that have gone, you know, astray or away from uh, the faith and so forth, or living in a way that's really at odds with the church or with the teaching of the gospel. Um, I had a gentleman come up to me and, and kind of try to pick a fight with me a couple of years ago. I'm, I'm actually very, very calm. I don't know if you noticed that. I'm very and it's not the medication or anything. It's just the way I am. And uh, uh, it takes a lot to get me, you know, to explode or something. I, maybe four or five times in my whole life I can recall. But he was he was uh, trying to get under my skin about um, uh, something to do with the, the moral life in the church. Or it might have might have to be about. Um, I think it was. Uh, adultery and you know and divorce and annulments and that kind of thing and i, and I just listened and then finally I, I said you know you're not mad at me i'm not responsible for that i'm the messenger but you got to take it up with him because he's the one that that gave it in the gospel he's the one that wrote about that about you shall not enter in a new marriage if you are divorced that it is adultery now remember that annulment for the Catholic Church isn't Catholic divorce. What it is, is trying to discern whether that what appears to be a first marriage had something so faulty in the beginning before or at the time of the marriage that it really wasn't a covenant. It looked like it, but it really wasn't. And we can prove that. So, for instance, I had a, a couple that I married. Well, I was, um, yeah, I married. And a beautiful couple, the, the mom and dad had uh, five girls, all beautiful girls. They were all sent to uh, Gonzaga University. They came back educated, very strong in their faith. And uh, one of them married this guy, seemed like a very, very nice guy. They had dated for a while. And then about six months into the marriage, she realized, well, he was a lawyer, that he wasn't a lawyer. And that uh, he was getting dressed, putting a suit on, putting his, um, you know, valise together or his, his um, briefcase. Thank you. And then he would go out to the park and he'd sit in the park and, you know, just sit there all day long and then come back home like he'd been at work. And, you know, they were... Her side of the family had money, as you can imagine, if they sent all the girls to Gonzaga. And I think he just figured, well, you know, it's going to work out somehow. Well, she found out and she was completely destroyed by it. And so when she went to the church, she said, I, I can't trust this man. I don't even know who he is anymore. All this time, I thought I knew him. And the church granted the annulment because she did not marry the man she thought she married. See? Something was wrong before or at the time of marriage. Absolutely. A big, big uh, lie, you know, dishonesty. And that uh, was the proof that that was not a true marriage. Now, the next marriage, I don't know if she ever got married again, but if she did, that is not her second marriage. That's her first marriage. Now, civilly, civil state will say, no, we got two friends in your second marriage. That's civil stuff. But according to the sacrament, no, that's the first marriage. Okay. Okay. Down to chapter 16, verse 3. Here we are now. We're getting into uh, the Antichrist. And can we go to the next slide, Paul? He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. This is the um, heart of the Antichrist. 
and of what will happen. And in that verse 3, for in the last days, the false prophets and corruptors shall be multiplied. And the sheep shall be turned into wolves and love shall be turned into hate. Verse 6, and then shall the signs of the truth appear first, a sign of a rift in the heavens. Then the sign of a voice of a trumpet. And thirdly, a resurrection of the dead. Okay. So um, it's amazing to me, really, and I'm still dumbfounded by it, that in this document, this early document, they chose to address the end of the world. So here you are, you have the church who is starting out, getting on her two feet, organizing herself, and now she's already talking about when everything's going to collapse. And she's talking about, as you will see too, infiltration into the body of Christ. And um, the saints say, and specifically um, in the book of Revelation, St. John, that at the end there will be a great apostasy. Okay. Apostasy means a, a great falling away of the people from the faith. Now, when Reformation happened, we have some documents where people actually thought the end of the world was happening because they could not fathom that the whole of Christendom was disintegrating. Germany had walked away from the church. The lowlands had all left the church. And uh, England left the church because of a divorce, and you know everything was was falling apart. The French, then there was great division between Catholics and Huguenots. Uh, it was you know massacres and people, uh, depending on the king, people being burned at the stake or executed. Uh, it was a really terrible, terrible time. There's a, a wonderful book. Um, I think it's the author, I think the one who wrote it is Eamon Duffy, who's a great, great um, historian. And they found a document of a priest who lived during the reign of um, Henry VIII, um, Mary, and Elizabeth. And this guy, in order to survive, he just kind of flowed with it all. And so there's all a document showing that when Henry VIII broke with Rome and said no more statues, and he took out all the statues, and uh, no, you can't uh, pray for the Pope anymore, no more rosary, okay, then all those things, and trying to deal with Cromwell so that he didn't get his land taken away, you know, the church land and so forth, and he made it, Henry VIII died. And then you have um, uh, the son, who becomes uh, king for a very, very short time. But it's a very, actually, he's the one that really put um, the Protestant stamp on England. But then he dies uh, from smallpox, I think, very young age. And then Mary comes in, Mary Tudor. And Mary restores Catholicism. So now Father brings back all the statues and puts them all in again, <laughs> brings the incense out and everything. and. Happy as clam doing, you know, all that we used to do as Catholics and so forth. And then Mary dies and Elizabeth I becomes Queen of England. And then, oh, okay, here we go, take everything out again. And, and it's a, kind of a log or a journal of, of all those years. And it's fascinating, you know, to see what, what people went through. And you can imagine that if, um, you know, we're living in medieval times and the king, who has such great authority, decides, hey, we're not Catholic anymore. You know, and if you go to Catholic mass, you're going to be fined. And then after so many times you're going, you're going to be thrown into prison and your kids can't go to university anymore. And da 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 You know, what do you do? You know, it's a real um, attack on conscience, right? And so then you have um, in uh, uh, Asia, especially, you know, in Japan, if uh, this is all you have to do, all you have to do is just step on the cross. Step on the cross and you're free. We won't bother you. And so you have all those uh, Japanese martyrs, the, the Catholics who refuse to step on the cross. A simple thing, they just put a little cross, little, 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 tiny. 
just we're, we're the only ones that are going to see it. But they refuse to do that because it would be rejecting everything they know. In effect, uh, they will not betray Christ. And this will happen over and over again in the life of the church. Right. And thanks be to God in our own country, Christianity in, has not been put to the test that way. Um, whereas in, in places like Asia or Africa, um, there's been real, real persecution, even death, martyrdom and so forth. Um, ours has been a different kind of martyrdom. Ours has been a very subtle one. It's been an eating away at what it means to belong to Christ. You know, the moral life, all these things, it's just subtle eating away. And it's a kind of martyrdom, really, that you're, you're martyrs. Yes, that's what I really want to say. You're martyrs in a different way because you have to fight for your savior almost every day now. <laughs> With all the stuff coming out about transgender and all these kind of things are redefining. We don't need, we can't even say what a woman is anymore. What's a woman? I can't tell you. I don't know. What are you? you know? Well, there's there's something wrong, you know, and and this cuts at the very foundations of Christianity, really, because Christianity um, is the the faith that brought in um, the uh, the discernment and the ability to speak about eternal things and about what's a man, what's a woman, you know, what does it mean to be good? How do we get to heaven? You know, all these wonderful, I mean, from the very beginning, of, it has shaped history, certainly shaped Western civilization, Judeo-Christian, right? And, um, and now there is a real push to just erase and wash away anything, um, any roots or anything like that of um, Christianity in our country. So I, when I was pastor at St. Columban's, um, I told the, the principal and the teachers, I want you to teach about uh, Abraham Lincoln, Washington. I want you to tell the story to the kids about the cherry tree and Lincoln. Remember when he walks all those miles away, and you be like, oh, boy, I took a penny more than I should have. And he goes all the way back and gives it to the, you know, the store owner. And I'm sorry. And the store owner says, oh, what a good boy you are here. Keep it. And it's like, oh, just a penny. OK, great. You know, it takes it and goes. But the point being honest Abe, right? But these were the ways that we taught virtue. And uh, remember that our country is not that old. And so the founding fathers employed people like um, Irving in order to write a uh, myth for our country. Um, Rip Van Winkle, um, the Headless Horseman, I mean, all those stories, those, those old, old stories, they were written on the spot. They, they weren't things that grew up over time, like in Europe. Europe has a long history of myths and Asia, but not the United States because we were too young. But the founding fathers realized that we needed myth. We needed a history. We needed to come from somewhere and something um, in order to stabilize ourselves. Why is it that... Washington, D.C. looks like um, Roman architecture. That's why. Um, if you map out the city of Washington, D.C., it's the city of Paris. All the streets and everything, it's, it's the same map of Paris. And that was for all the major um, cities at one time in the world. They would, they would um, imitate Paris because Paris was seen as just the, the plum. You know, and so uh, you go to the Washington Memorial and you see, what do you see? You see them, they're dressed in togas and everything. They didn't wear togas, but they're wearing these things, you know, because it was to, to give Americans this sense of, of history that they fit, that we came from something. We remember like before, we are standing on something, not on sand, but we're standing on books, history. Well, uh, somewhere along the way, we forgot to talk about saints. We don't tell those stories anymore. We don't tell the story of Our Lady of Fatima, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our Lady of Lourdes. We know it, but do, do your kids know? 
I can remember going to the supermarket when I was a kid with my mom, and they would have these little books for sale, and it was a book on St. Anthony and St. Francis, and, and we bought them, and, and I still have them. They're, they're really, really sweet, um, made for a child's age, right? And, um, but th that was being sold in you know, the supermarket. But today, you're not gonna find anything like that. It's all on you know, Hollywood and those kind of things, which are not really fun. OK, let's take a break. Ten minutes, everybody. Then we'll come back. Okay, everybody, let's get together. Remember that sometimes a question came up about confession. So what happens if you have someone that has dementia or someone that can't confess anymore because of a situation like that? And, um, you know, um, everything is about the mercy of God. He gives us sacraments to help us and to move us along the journey. But if uh, one is not able to receive for a good reason like that, if, if a person has dementia and cannot recall anymore, then um, we just, you know, pray. And we, um, my experience is even with people with dementia, uh, but especially with people a lot of times in coma. Um, I've had a number of times where I come to anoint, I'm doing the prayers. And then when we say the Our Father or the Hail Mary, they come out for, it's amazing. And with dementia, they're very clear and they'll pray the prayers from heart. And maybe nothing else can, you know, will come your way, but the Our Father and the Hail Mary do. And that's because wow, we grew up with that, right? And we, we said that so many times and we said it with love. And so those prayers remain very powerful. So, um, but in all things, finally, you know, we, we rest on the mercy and the goodness of God. Um, it's great if you can receive the Atticum, you know, before death, you receive your last Holy Communion. But if you can't, if for some reason you're not able to, that doesn't mean that um, you're, you're not going to heaven. It just means that that one help is not there, but there are many others, including the Virgin, St. Michael, the saints, your guardian angel, and so forth. Okay. Um, I want to walk through this just a little quickly. Um, this is a scary part of, I have to be honest with you, the, the Antichrist and the end of the world is a little scary. And there's just no way to get around it. And I would say the best way to hold off the end of the world is for us to become missionaries and bring more and more people into the faith. Because as we said, one of the signs of the end will be the great apostasy where people are just going to leave in droves. Another is the temple of Jerusalem will be rebuilt, which sounds almost impossible because the Muslims have their temple right now where the temple of Jerusalem used to be. But According to um, the saints, what will happen is that the Antichrist will take down the Temple of the Mount and will rebuild the Temple of Jerusalem. All because he has in his plan that he will reveal to the Jews first that he is the new Messiah. So basically what most saints hold to is that, and most of the, uh, I'm talking about St. Jerome, St. Ephraim, uh, St. Um, Irenaeus, all the great church fathers. These are the, the bishops that are uh, writing right after the apostles. They deal a lot also with the end times and uh, who the Antichrist will be. And they say that the Antichrist must be the opposite of Jesus Christ in some things. So, in the same way that the Christ came into the world through the Virgin, the Antichrist will come into the world through adultery. 
And so um, it will be a, a woman who is somehow consecrated to God, and yet she will defile herself, and he will be brought into the world that way. He will be quiet the same way Christ was quiet. He will work miracles the same way that Christ will work miracles. He is not the devil. He's the devil's mouthpiece. He is possessed. But he is fully activated and fully given over to uh, the devil. He will become a leader of the world in such a way that the world, a lot of the saints, early saints wrote that there will be um, a terrible war. And in fact, scripture said that there will be a, a terrible war before the Antichrist comes. And the reason why is because people will be desperate for real leadership, desperate for peace, tired of the warfare and everything. And he will be charming and really intelligent politically. He will come across as being a wonderful, wonderful man. He will not show himself at all to be evil. And the people will come under his sway and will agree with his vision, which is to have one world government. Because he will say, we are past this. We're in a new era now. We are past the time of kings and kingdoms and governments that take advantage of the people. And I will lead us into a new era. We'll have one government to take care of the affairs of the whole world. Okay, no more. Um, um, corruption, no more uh, politicizing. Um, we're going to be united as one people, even though we are different cultures and everything. And then he will create a new church, a new religion that will be a gathering of all the churches and religions so that everyone will agree, you know, for peace sake, yes, let's do this. Okay. And then he will announce himself to be the one who has come, the Messiah. Once he announces that, then there is a seven-year window of the, um, uh, the Antichrist. He will begin at the age of 30. He will last only until the age of 33. But seven years, so four years, he's preparing. The three, three and a half years will be that terrible, terrible uh, persecution of anyone who opposes him, and especially the church. The church always remains the one threat to kings throughout history. Look what's happening in China. So the church is, he, the, China is creating a counterfeit church. And um, and people are, are are really suffering under it. And Pope Francis is trying to find a way through this. Hard to tell. I, I mean, at this point, even the um, uh, the cardinal under him, who's in charge of these affairs, said there's not much progress to show. And what's been uh, the church trying to find her way in China and freedom under the communist regime. So it may fail, this experiment that Pope Francis is trying. So we have to see. But um, always, either a counterfeit church is made or the church is, tr they try to stamp out the church completely. Because a king or a tyrant will not be patient with another king who may have authority, break into his authority or have authority over his uh, kingdom. So the, the thing about the Pope is that he is the vicar of Christ and head of all Catholics. That's a lot of people. And it doesn't matter if he's Italian or Argentinian or African. It doesn't matter. What matters is he's the Pope, the vicar of Rome. And when that happens, every king is a little uncomfortable. Because just the way, remember with uh, President Kennedy. You know, are you going to impose Catholicism if you become president? See, there, there's always this, are, are you going to make us a Catholic nation or a Catholic 
you know, under the thumb of the Pope of Rome or that kind of thing. And the problem that we've had, especially with politicians, is that in order to find their way through, they've compromised many of them into personally, I feel this way, but I cannot impose that on the people. Well, if that's your argument, you can't impose anything on the people. So if a politician is against the death penalty, which the church is, if the politician is against that, um, they all fight for it, right? They're all saying, we got to stop this, and they go to the president, and they go to the government, and they go to Congress, and they stand up and, and they say, you know, it's not right, um, people should not be put to death, and, and so forth. Well, you're imposing your, you know, your, your own belief, again. It happens to be Catholic, also. But uh, when we elect people, this is why when you elect, you, you, the best you can, you need to know who you're electing. Um, because that person is going to represent you, but they're going to have to come from what they know and what they believe. And some of that may not, you know, work with what you know, and what you believe. So it's very important that we take that seriously. I know it's very complicated and we have to do the best we can with it. So does that sound okay? Yeah, it's, it's a very tricky thing, but, um, but what we have is um, now um, all sorts of, again, confusion. Just think for a minute, all the Catholics, we're the largest uh, religion in the United States. Just think if all the Catholics were on board with just the basics, the essentials of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Just think what this country would be. Uh, we would really be a light, but the light has to be clear, you know, um, instead, we, we sometimes provide confusion, and that's not what Christ wants, and it's not what the church really wants either. So, but now I can harangue about politicians, and about the president, and about this and that, whatever, but bottom line is, it's our responsibility. If we're strong as Catholics, just think what St. Anne's could be, and Seal Beach could be. Just think how we could impact this city in such a beautiful and powerful way, gentle way, by our charity, by our prayer, by our support of everything that's good, encouraging everything that's good. You know, standing with people who are suffering, the poor, it doesn't matter what religion they are. See, that's always been the hallmark of Catholicism is we're not introspective. We, we help others, even if they're not our, our faith tradition. We help them because they're human and they have souls and we want everybody to go to heaven. That's why we help. That's why we pray. All those prayers of the faithful that are never just about ourselves. That's why, because we want everyone to go to heaven and God is the one that judges. We just do what we're supposed to do. So we don't have to figure out how many people are going to hell and that kind of thing or who's in hell besides Judas or fallen angels or all those any interesting questions that you can never really fully answer. But the the preoccupation of the Catholic should be, how can I get you to heaven? And by the way, that's what marriage is for. The husband and wife are supposed to help each other to heaven. That's why they're brought together in the, in the sacrament. Because in God's will and time, this is the person that's going to help me to go to the kingdom. And without you, I may not make it. And for the, for the religious, that's the person that I'm wedded to, to God, right? So I wear a ring. Father, do you wear a ring? He doesn't wear a ring. He's single still. That's right. <laughs> so some of us wear rings, but I wear a ring, and, uh, um, but I'm not married to Jesus. Sometimes people have, you know, because they think of the nuns, the nuns wear rings. The nuns are brides of Christ. They're married to Christ. That's spousal relationship, but the priest is married to the church. See, the, the church is the feminine, and this is why in, when we talk about the church, we call her, her or she, not it. Please never say it, because when you say it, when you're referring to the church, it's a, it's a machine. It's an institution. It doesn't have a soul, but St. Paul and Benedict, Pope Benedict uh, Emeritus, reminded us 
that we should not use it when we speak of the church. We should use the feminine. Okay. Because the church is the bride of Christ, right? Okay. So um, the Antichrist, then, there's no room for repentance in him. So don't, don't fall into the temptation of movies where he's struggling with, oh, my gosh, what's going to, you know, I, I really don't want to be a part of the devil, but it's my destiny. Or No, that's crud. That's, you know, that's, or that there's that show, which I have never seen, but I know enough about it, Lucifer. And it's the same thing about, oh, this poor misunderstood angel. You know, Satan fell from heaven, and now, you know, just people treat him so badly, they misunderstand. Well, not really that bad of a guy. And God just kind of was too harsh. And, you know, so I'm trying to find a way back to heaven, and if he would just let me in. Well, at least now here, I can I can maybe prove to him I'll be a superhero. And I'll take, I'll do some good to show that, you know, I'm not the evil guy that everybody has put me out to be. But see, that's all craziness. See? And um, and we got to be careful, you know, in in how we bring in the media and these things because it can affect even our our way of thinking or teaching. Um, because it would be nice to think that the devil really had a heart, but he doesn't. Okay, or that he really has a soft spot for me. He doesn't. He's a murderer. He wants to murder you. And except for God's loving grace that protects you and me, he wants to even murder even more, Father John and me. If he can get rid of the priest, even better. Take away the shepherd and the sheep are, you know, don't know what to do. And so um, it, it's very important then that we recognize evil for what it is and we protect ourselves from evil. Um, no wonder that Christ put that in the, in the Our Father. Deliver us from evil, or the evil one. Deliver us from evil. Amen. That's the very last piece of that, right? Okay. So the um, three and a half years will be terrible. And at the end of it, though, Christ will come. Now, there was a question is, um, how do we know if someone says, I'm the Christ, how do we know that that's the Antichrist and not really Jesus Christ, because we know he's coming again. And the saints give this wonderful um, teaching where they say the Antichrist comes from the earth. In other words, he's born here. We will know him. He, he's a great educator. He's a great politician. We're going to have a lot of time to, to fall under his sway and everything. But the Christ, when he comes again, will not come from the earth. He will come from the heavens. He will come upon the clouds. And so the saints say, this is how you will know Jesus Christ, because he will not come from here. He will come suddenly from the kingdom of heaven itself. And that's the Christ we will know when he uh, pronounces himself. And the saints say, even the elect, and this says to indicate, even the elect, the ones who belong to Christ, must be careful because even some of the elect will stumble at the end. So um, we'll be brought into something and you know, we'll believe something that's false. So uh, the antidote, stay faithful to the gospel, stay faithful to the sacraments. Okay. And we see a lot of people, I know a lot of people too, who are kind of quasi faithful. They come to mass, you know, maybe once a month, maybe. They certainly come on Christmas and Easter, for a quinceanera or a baptism. Um, but is that relationship? I don't know. And then you got all those people that they, they call, hey, are you a Catholic? Yes, yeah, so I'd like to ask you a question. Do you believe in the real presence? And like, well, so, yeah, I guess, or, you know, because they haven't gone to church in years, but they know they're Catholic. Once a Catholic? Yeah, unfortunately. I mean, Fortunately and unfortunately, right? Because we've got a lot of people who claim to be Catholic, but they're not really Catholic. They were they left the Catholic Church a long, long time ago. And because of that, there's a skewed vision all the time that comes out of what Catholics believe. Now, I, you know, I my impression is that if people who were doing these studies went to the doors, front doors of St. Anne's and asked those same questions, you're going to get a different response. Because 
this is the the people that love their faith, struggle with their faith, believe in their faith, um, and will answer, yeah, I believe in the real presence. You know that. Do you really believe that the bread and wine becomes the body and blood? Yeah. Can you explain it? No. no. Don't try. I wouldn't either. Say, no, I can't, but I believe it. And they may not like the answer. Too bad. So what? You don't like my answer, so what? Right? Why should I get all personal about it and get, you know, all, you know, emotional about it? You know, you you have to believe me. No, I don't. I wish you would, but um, what's important is I know. Okay. Now I can talk about transubstantiation and all those things, but even if I talk about all those wonderful things, that doesn't tell the story of what happens with the bread and wine. We know that. It's it's a mystery. Even in heaven, it will not be complete because we it's just too mysterious, too beautiful, right? Okay. Cardinal Newman. Interesting. Now he looked back in the uh, 1800s. He's the convert from the Anglican Church to the Catholic Church, became one a great saint for our church. But look what he writes at. This is in his time. Is there not a vigorous and united movement in all countries to cast down the Church of Christ from power and place? Is there not a feverish and ever busy endeavor to get rid of the necessity of religion in public transactions? An attempt to educate without religion, our own public schools, college and universities. An attempt to supersede religion altogether, as far as it is external or objective, as far as it is displayed in ordinances or can be expressed by written words, to confine it to inner feelings, keep it personal. And thus, considering how variable, how evanescent our feelings are, an attempt, in fact, to destroy religion. Wow, has anything changed? No. Oh, look at that. This could have been written today. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's something. It's relevant. So my purpose in putting that up from St. Henry Newman is to say, let's keep perspective. The end could come you know, in three years, and it can come in 3,000 years, 300 years. Okay, next slide, please. So remember, we're not tonight talking about everything connected to the Antichrist because that's a whole separate series, but just to that little portion that does come out in the Didache. So Cardinal Newman finally writes this, which I think is very beautiful. Surely, with this prospect before us, we cannot but feel that we are what all Christians really are in the best estate, pilgrims, watchers waiting for the morning, waiting for the light, eagerly straining our eyes for the first dawn of the day, looking out for our Lord's coming, his glorious advent, when he will end the reign of sin and wickedness, accomplish the number of his elect, and perfect those who at present struggle with infirmity, yet in their hearts love and obey him. Beautiful, right? Very hopeful. So he says, finally, just love him. Be obedient to him. Everything will, will fall into place. Whatever happens will happen, but um, you should not be anxious. You should not lose sleep about this, right? We need to know what's going to happen. That's good. So we're not caught unawares. We need to be prepared. That's really the bottom line. Okay. All right. So that's going to end our series. Now, a couple of things. I did put a basket in back in case you don't have to, but in case you want to leave a couple shekels or something that goes to the church, not to me, not for my vacation or anything, but it goes to the church because, you know, we have air conditioning, which is nice and the lights and so any little bit will help. Um, and I'm going to do that after every series that I do. So it'll be the last night. If you put something, that's great. If you don't, that's okay too. And um, also before we end, um, I'd like to ask, um, how, you know, for you, this is the first series that we had. Uh, I have a, I'm going to take a break for about three weeks or so, and I'll announce a new series. They'll never be longer than five weeks. They'll be either three weeks or five weeks. Be on different topics. Has this been a help to you? Yes. Okay. Would somebody like to just say how it's helped them? I think it's good for all, all of us to hear this. Good for me, too. 
I don't think I need the mic for it. <laughs> Online is it just shows that our faith is truly linked to the work of Jesus Christ and we do it on earth, coming through the apostles and into the church elders. And that it started much earlier than I realized. So appreciate the time, Brother John. Thanks for doing this happen thing and uh, very good for all. But it grounded me that way. Thank you. Good, good, good. Anybody else that helped you to come deeper, you know, to your faith in your Lord? Yeah, for a few minutes, uh, I think last week. Yeah, you mentioned last week about, uh, I never knew I'm, I've been going to Mass for 86 years and I, I didn't know this. But when you put the water in the chalice for the wine going in there, yeah. the water represents us. Right. I didn't know. So what I'm saying is, I mean, a lot of these things that uh, we kind of take for granted or just believe it because we've been told to believe it, a little explanation would help, I think, a lot. Things like simple things like, why do we stand and kneel and stand and kneel and sit and kneel and stand? A lot of people ask those questions, you know. I mean, it's, I don't know why, but uh, people might not, might not, even Catholics, you know, what kind of stuff. So uh, things like this, look at you in a group like this, so maybe even the last, take a couple of minutes yeah. during the homily and say, okay, this is, why did you send up? And then say, why? <laughs> All right. You know, do you know why we incense around um, a casket at the funeral mass? Do you know why? Prayer is going to have to have, no, that's not why. That's not why. I mean, that certainly is, it happens, but that's not why. Because that's something that we brought in from our Jewish tradition. Because the high priests of the temple, if they incensed around anything, furniture or anything, that was now dedicated only to the temple of Jerusalem and could not be used in any other way. So Catholics, we incense around the bodies of our dead to say, they are meant for the new Jerusalem and nowhere else. They belong to him. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Wow. See, see, this is the thing. So many symbols, so many things going on in, in our faith and our mass and so forth. And we need to remember, you know, because it's really like that small thing, but how powerful, how beautiful, how consoling for a family that's lost somebody. The church is saying. By every authority and power we have, we dedicate even the body of your loved one to the new Jerusalem, that it may not be lost. Right? Beautiful. Right? I learned that um, everything that we do, it started way, way, way before we even, the, 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 the liturgical rites that we now was actually created when, when the new Christians came up together and how it should be carried through, like how to baptize, how to do this and how to do that. And um, and, it, and then now I understand why it's not part of the gospel. It's because the gospel I think is more theological. And this one is the how to, from what I can see. Well, remember that not everything is in the gospel. Not everything is in the, um, the New Testament or the Old Testament. So for instance, when we're dealing with something like nuclear arms, you're not going to find any kind of a connection to anything that the Lord said or anybody else said. So what we have to do is we look at what was given to us as foundational things, and that helps us to determine what would God have us do. You know, so we look at virtue, we look at um, the Ten Commandments and so forth. Um, you shall not kill, you know, all these things that then the, the church has to discern and then um, figure out. You know, how do we um, approach this question, whatever it is, transgender? There's nothing in the Bible about that, right? But it has to be discerned and determined. Um, and it probably starts with the Garden of Eden. He made them male and female, did he make them? Okay, well, there's your first start. You know? And he wasn't confused about it. And so now that doesn't mean that people don't have legitimate problems but it means that we have to deal with them in a certain way, compassionately and so forth, but you cannot erase truth either at the same time. So maybe we'll have a series someday on, on morals too, which should be helpful. Okay, uh, yes, sir. I think chapter one, 
point one, this problem is the most relevant aspect of the, the entire history. You want to you want to read that out loud? Yeah. And it says there are two ways: one of life and one of death. And there is a great difference between the two ways. In life, he seems to, to look for the grayness and everything. But the early Christians were saying you can either follow, you know, the will of God, and that's free will, or you can follow the will of the devil, and that's free will. So for me, it just made things so much clearer and cleaner. Yeah, there's sometimes we forget that there is still black and white. Yeah. Yeah, and not everything is gray or smudgy. That's true. Yeah. Yes. Antichrist, what about the miracles? He will perform the miracles through the power of the devil. But the interesting thing is that whatever miracles he performs, they cannot last. Eventually, they decay. They will look like miracles of Christ or, or the Virgin and so forth, but they will. That's how we know even now. For instance, I'm going to close with this. Uh, when Our Lady of Lourdes appeared to St. Bernadette, there was another apparition of a virgin going on in um, France. And um, the bishops were very concerned because they wanted to make sure that, okay, why would the Virgin be appearing in two different places to two different girls and so forth? And so they, the bishops said, take holy water. And when the Virgin appears, throw the holy water at her to see what happens. And the idea being that um, the devil cannot stomach holy water. And then like Teresa of Avila said, holy water is the most powerful, simple, but most powerful thing that we have in our weapons because the devil must leave when holy water is used because that creates the the uh, covenant baptism he, he hates it because of that okay so um the um girl whoever she was and receiving the other apparitions she threw the holy water and um the virgin who was talking to her all of a sudden there was a tail that came up and then the whole thing disappeared when bernadette through the holy water at the Lady of the Lords, she just looked at her and smiled. <laughs> so, yeah, beautiful. So, anyways, okay. So, it's a story to, to remember and maybe share. Good story, Bernadette. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so let's close here. And so, again, I thank you, and Father John, thank you too for working our slides. Let's give them a hand. You know, this is Father's Day off, so he's been coming, you know, for part of his day to be with us, and that's that's really a nice sacrifice. That's, he loves you guys. So let's close with a prayer. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we thank you. We love you, Jesus, with all our hearts, and help us in our weakness to be faithful to you and to um, should you call us to be witnesses of uh, your love and mercy at the end of all things and give us the wherewithal for it um, if not help us to be faithful in these days so that we may call more and more people back to you and to your truth so that they may find um, eternal life and life in the kingdom that people will not fall asleep and think that this is the only reality this is the only world but in fact, um, this is supposed to prepare us for the world to come. And all things we place, all our um, uh, concerns, uh, all the prayers we have for people, for ourselves, we place in uh, your hands of mercy as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless and protect you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. All right, there you go.